the Center for Digital Con Contemporary Digital Performance. And today we have Johannes Dimitri, who is um, the director of our center and professor here. And most some of you will be in the class, and so we'll get to know him. And he's going to be talking about dispositif, which is a French word. Um, and he said to let me know that the seminars in French. <laughs> so we'll do, we'll do this live uh, translation of uh, performance repositions. So thank you so much. And please feel free, after he talks, there's coffee and, and something to drink and refreshment so that we can um, have time to have a conversation with Johannes after his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. Good afternoon. This is the uh, second seminar in our series, and as you perhaps know, we are broadcasting it live uh, to the Landscape Television. So um, on my left is camera, and we are uh, uh, welcoming also our online visitors. Uh, we are in record mode. Okay. The um, presentation is hopefully more like a conversation. I, uh, actually particularly interested also in perhaps having uh, input from our colleagues in music because to some extent just in the last few days my, my thinking is moving more and more in the direction of sound. But um, the, the theme of this presentation is about um, kind of understanding of the arrangement that we um, create in contemporary art forms that um, move between performance, physical performance, performing arts performance, <coughs> multimedia performance, sound, sound installation, and then interactive um, installations that I want to dwell on today. We're exploring particularly the uh, difficult relationship between performance and installation. The title image is just a um, uh, small pun, a reference to the history of performance art that uh, you can translate uh, to yourself. We you don't need to go into it, but when I thought about repositioning in the contemporary context of art, uh, there's a term that recently has come up that uh, I would like to investigate also in the future, and that's the term re-performance. And, and that is what the slide refers to. Um, <coughs> Marina Lapanovic, uh, in her recent exhibition at the uh, Museum of Modern Art, having some of her own early work from the 70s re-performed. Um, and so you see on the slide uh, a piece that she did uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago with her partner Ulai. Whereas in the uh, Museum of Modern Art, she performed alone, basically, uh, seated at the table, waiting for audiences to come and uh, meet her. And um, this sense of meeting or inviting uh, for conversation is something that um, underlies some of my questions in regard to installation work and contemporary performance. So the term that I chose is perhaps not as familiar but I came across it quite often yeah, in uh, cinema studies. Yeah? And so the notion of an arrangement, uh, perhaps defined best by uh, Jean-Louis Baudry in the 70s already, as film uh, scholars and film critics were studying um, the apparatus of the cinema. And apparatus would be perhaps the German word, apparat, uh, Bertolt Brecht, I think, uh, referred to the theater once as an apparat. But we don't often use uh, apparatus uh, reflection in theater, whereas in film studies, uh, I think this was quite important back then. Now, um, the French speakers among you will have no problems. Uh, I, I, I offer just a provisional translation. Uh, obviously, there are different elements that are provided in the setting. Yeah? In the cinema, we have the projector, a dark room, uh, like this black box here, and the screen. Yeah? And these elements, um, in a certain manner, uh, 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 
reproduce um, in a certain manner, yeah? uh, or reflect on what Plato described in his allegory of the cave. Yeah? Uh, remember the famous allegory in the Republic? And, um, and this sort of exemplary setting uh, is uh, referring to also our, I guess, Western philosophical traditions, <coughs> worrying about transcendence. It's a model of topology for idealism and uh, what's already built into the platonic sort of thinking about uh, shadows and, and the ideas. Yeah? And also he's referring here to the mirror in the theory of uh, Lacan. The second uh, uh, um, quotation is about the dispositive cinematographic. Yeah? It proposes to, to you, to the subject of uh, perceiving, yeah? a certain kind of reality. Um, yeah? And this reality is constituted through representations and the perception of these representations. So film studies often worry about how does the dispositive create the illusion that, for example, in the cinema, you feel immersed into the action. And uh, uh, as I'm reading on sound, I'm becoming fascinated by those few books I found on sound and film, yeah? how, how sound functions in film, and how, for example, when you look at an actor in the movies, generally, the sound will be synced, yeah? so that uh, you have the illusion of the actor is speaking to you, uh, is embodied in speech and voice. And of course, you can imagine what would happen if you would disturb that scene. Yeah? And you recall in silent movie, of course, uh, uh, there was um, only perhaps the gesture of the voice and then the intertitle. What I'm proposing now is I don't want to read. Uh, the manuscript is now almost 40 pages, but I want to ask you, ask myself, is it actually possible to create a critical and theoretical writing through a blog? A lot of my thinking now actually occurred through a very recent workshop I did in the United States this summer. And every day as we were creating these installations and these audio-visual environments, we were trying to reflect on them and create a vocabulary for the um, arrangements that we were taking to create certain kinds of illusions. And uh, I will address these in a moment. The other work in progress that I draw from is um, a chapter on lighting. I land here? No. Uh, I think it's a very important aspect that we tend to often um, overlook, especially, however, I think it's important when you work with film projection in the theater. So rather than the dark theater in the illusionistic space of the cinema, with all of its psychological and ideological issues that were examined by these film critics, in the theater we have a bit more distance generally, and the actors are under the light, or the dancers, unless you mix up this separation between the auditorium and the stage, and you choose a different arrangement. Now, when you are mixing on-stage action with on-stage projection, uh, it tends to be actually very tricky to work out uh, the lighting so that, to some extent, you can easily move between um, uh, stage performance and the screen performance. So I'm interested in projection environments as a dispositive where decisions have to be made for um, the arrangements. I now like to show uh, a few slides that are part of this chapter. What I'm doing there is I'm examining, going back in history, some dispositives, some arrangements for video installations, or more correctly, audiovisual installations, because Many of these installations, of course, involve sound. And I um, became intrigued by work that's very rarely discussed, actually, in uh, performance contexts, and that's Andy Warhol's work back in the 60s when he started to work with film and also with video and with installations in the factory. And this is a piece called uh, Outer and Inner Space, 
where he uses a diptych projection with uh, the actress um, Eddie Sedgwick uh, projected twice uh, in the double frame and um, the sound is played both sounds from both films simultaneously and there's a slight uh, discrepancy between them so that there is a sort of desynchronization and a distortion and if you actually listen to it it's very hard to hear what the actress is actually saying in this installation. Peter Campos, uh, another early installation artist who uh, became interested in closed circuit video, I think for me already an early prototype for uh, interfacial setup and interface is going to be one of our subjects today um, once the performer or the audience is invited into the artwork and here you see Peter Campos himself demonstrating uh, uh, the interactive relationship to the camera and his mirror reflection. Um, uh, he's projecting this image on plexiglass and um, I think Campus was very interested in the psychological dimension of uh, self and other, self and image, self and echo of um, that, um, the self. And this often, at that time, of course, made critics wonder whether this new medium of video encouraged a certain kind of narcissism and self-reflectiveness that's often very um, circular. But uh, again, if I may refer to sound, the um, relationship of voice to your own understanding of yourself, what you're saying, is uh, intriguing. There was a piece back in the early 70s by Nancy Holt called Boomer, where she recorded herself speaking in a sound studio and they were playing back her live recording with a delay of about four or five seconds. And as she tried to keep her stream of consciousness, hearing her own voice coming back at her, it created, I think, interferences in her you know, functioning of the brain and her way of perceiving herself and she found it more and more difficult to speak and to articulate. As installations become perhaps more uh, multiple, yeah, multiple monitors, multiple projections, you see these kind of um, arrangements in large galleries where in this case the viewer is free to walk around and if you look carefully, perhaps we can lower the light a little bit. Uh, I want you to, to be aware that here the artist is exposing the um, apparatus, so to speak. In other words, unlike many museums that hide the projector or install it up there somewhere invisible to you, here you have monitors and cables uh, running around the ground. Yeah? And um, uh, this leads me to, to think about a, a very critical question of the apparatus. I write, the cinematographic, perhaps also videographic, dispositive produces moving images and often it has to allocate the sound somewhere in space. And if you are thinking about doing video, be, be aware of this, that um, you have different screens or screening uh, spaces and uh, monitors often have a loudspeaker built in yeah? but these don't and uh, with video installations you have to deposit your sound source somewhere uh, and I think again if you were to hang the speaker here it uh, creates a separation from let's say an image and sound where sometimes you of course don't know how to associate sound to a particular image and uh, this creates interesting possibilities. The cinematographic dispositive produces moving images by removing other dimensions from the spectator's gaze in the dark room. You are in front of the screen, there is nothing else. The mediating principle of cinema requires that the depth of projection is denied so that the depth of field may exist. Again, this is maybe what you could call the magic of the cinematic producing 
certain immersion effect drawing you in, it's a sleight of hand, uh, which also reproduces this cinematic uh, sort of magic and tension. And that is similar to the ancestral forms of cinema, magic lantern, shadow play. Yeah? And the cinema is, in that sense, an ensemble of techniques that try to make you focus on image on the surface, light falls on the surface. And there is a seemingly empty space between the projector, yeah, the projector lamp, and the screen. But that is where cinema actually also happens. This is where the perception when the we as the audience are located. Yeah? And uh, in a recent discussion on this subject, some artists, and there was a very interesting uh, 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 writer from South America, Gabriel Menotti, he spoke of the thickness of the screen, trying to examine the material properties of audiovisual media and um, examining the immersion effect. Yeah? Uh, looking at what is hidden in this relationship between projection and the projected. Yeah? So, uh, in this case, the uh, gallery uh, exposes at least some of the cable and hardware. Some artists in their performances, again, hide the hardware and focus on the effect. This is a performance by Klaus Obermeier where the projection is extremely precisely directed at the dancers, almost as if the dancer is either sculpted out by light so that the dancer on stage right is lit by theater light, whereas the dancer on stage left in the foreground is actually lit by the film projection light. Uh, which is creating uh, a large back projection as well as the on-body projection with the uh, horizontal lines. Separating um, foreground and background. Very complex uh, uh, work with lighting here. If you go to the conventional theater today, uh, actually more and more and more productions now use um, video in the staging, in the scenography. This is an image from Berlin, Frank Kastorf, who has his own camera team, uh, always working with the actors. And so you see the set, you see the, the outside and the inside, there's a room. And then when some of the actors go inside the room, they then appear on the screen upstairs, yeah. um, projected, and action happens inside, behind the set, as well as in front. And this mixing uh, creates, again, interesting issues about flatness and depth in the theatre. Yeah? Contemporary examples of multimedia art uh, where this becomes, perhaps we can lower the light a bit and really enjoy this uh, slide. Uh, the Builders Association, a group from New York, um, I think what they did here was they created quite a number of smaller surfaces and um, these smaller screens are actually on motor motorized devices and they can flip. So sometimes they are facing you square, sometimes they disappear. And then as they edit their projected footage, they can distribute it uh, where they want on stage. And it therefore creates this sort of dispersed, larger, fragmented screening environment. Uh, the piece is called Continuous City. And uh, in the center, I think, is this um, little girl uh, whose father is traveling and communicating uh, with her through Skype. And so very often you see um, the telepresent image coming in behind her. But as you notice, the staging is quite flat. Uh, it's happening on a lateral expanse. And uh, these were some of the slides I wanted to show you. And then in my own work, I will intersperse this. Um, we are also working, of course, with projection, but in the current piece, we are trying to have the performance and the physical dance happen in an environment where um, the projection is not like in the theater or the cinema behind the actor or up front, but projections are distributed in three-dimensional space and so are the dancers. So this creates enormous problems because you have to somehow create uh, spaces for the performers and then 
um, if you no longer separate the audience out, you have to invite the audience in. So uh, in the last version, we had three screens suspended somewhere in the space, and I'll come back to this. And the performance is an open staging, meaning the uh, audience is invited in. Now this character here, I call him the engineer. He increasingly throughout the performance is working, working with a microphone. And um, he's recording things that are happening. Uh, he's also in the opening scene inviting the audience to listen to the environment. And so this is another question I have, namely when we come from a theater or dance performing background, we often, I think, are very much geared towards the visual um, sort of performance methodology. And um, what I'm learning from some installation artists and from some sound installation artists is that uh, it is, of course, sometimes necessary maybe to focus on the sound more. So I'm not sure, uh, uh, how, uh, I have not seen your own performances, but um, I know, for example, that some sound artists, if they are specifically wanting you to listen, they uh, don't want you to see anything. I know this guy from Spain, Francisco Lopez, uh, you enter into a dark space and you only hear sound. This would then mean there are no instrumentalists, but it's it's um, electronic sound. Yeah? But what you're hearing is the the field recordings that he has processed, and he wants you to, I think, really go into the sound. So what I now begin to think is immersion or entering into space is perhaps something we should really learn from from perhaps a long tradition of sound, where sound, I think, is more I think, easily understood as an immersive medium because the ear takes everything that happens around and cannot sort of shutter out certain things as we can with, with the eyesight. I'm currently reading this book by Frances Dyson. It's called Sounding New Media. And uh, she is using the term orality, which I find fascinating. Uh, drawing our attention to, to the the listening. When we performed Okilio last with my ensemble, uh, we had a lot of people in the gallery and uh, sometimes very close relationships uh, are created between performer and listeners. And um, this was in Slovenia. When we opened the piece, they asked me to, it was a gallery, to say a few words to the audience in the beginning. So I, I welcomed them and I said, it's a, it's a concert, it's a installation, it's a performance, but we, we really invite you to, to listen first of all, because each of our dancers, each of our characters, to some extent, is an oral, an oral character, yeah? in a way, uh, making sound. Yeah? Uh, so I'm becoming now uh, aware that there is perhaps a philosophy of uh, orality, which I like to learn from because it affects our understanding, I think, of what is an installation, what is a performance of an installation, what is an installation that performs, what happens if we're still, and, and uh, this is where I think our company still is, we are still performing to the audience, and with the audience we, we haven't just created a scenario, is positive for the audience to come in. Perhaps Gretchen, you have more experience with this. Uh, in in Trajet, we don't perform, but it's the, it's the installation, the, the, the choreography of the space and the projections that is the performance. And so interactivity, or the mixing of physical and spirit reality, is the, is the challenge that we're facing with um, new concepts. So I now want to move to this notion of interactivity and immersion. And I give you the name of the author again because uh, this is uh, promising, I think. Um, especially since she very acutely picks on some of the terms that are floated in the contemporary discourse. If you open a book on new media today, you will hear about interactivity, yeah. uh, 
virtuality, uh, you hear about embodiment, uh, the post human uh, immersion, yeah, digital space. Uh, so uh, the way the new media operate uh, and perform um, draws us to an investigation of virtual reality, or at least a sense of the virtual, because we obviously don't here work with a full uh, 3D virtual reality um, immersive construction, but often we project images. Um, but this is taken uh, from my understanding of uh, Francis Dyson's critique. What often happens today is that uh, the writers on new media and on the new embodiment of digital media uh, see the virtual as a mode of existence now in which you enter and in which you are. So in other words, rather than thinking of the virtual as a, as a projection, as an illusion, yeah, uh, it is explained in ontological terms uh, and in metaphysical terms and sometimes in mystical terms. Yeah. And um, this experience of the immersion interests me. So I look at the example that is given in Dyson's book. And I have not been able to see this book. It comes from Canada. Uh, but before we go there, can we lower the light? Uh, my own experiments in Germany last year were to work with empty, abandoned space and to learn from the sound in the space. So this is a field recording in a very large uh, abandoned coal mine where we heard a small animal making this strange sound and we recorded it and then we processed it, processed it and then set up these loudspeakers to hear the, the sound and its echo in this vast empty space. And then, next example, we, we we created an experiment from Alvin Lucie's work. We recorded a sound that we had created in the space and then recorded it with microphones in the space. We recorded it, so we had second, third, fourth, fifth generation. And in other words, we're recording also the reverberations and the resonance of the space. I'm not obviously, please uh, interfere, let's have a brief interruption. I'm not an audio technologist, but obviously there, there seems to be feedback in the world also. And I think that happens inevitably when you re-record from a sound source like the speaker. Um, uh, do, we, do you teach audio technology in, in the music department? Yeah, poetry as well. And we work in some parts as well. Yeah, well, and Lucien in his piece by purpose uses speech as a source because speech has a whole frequency range um, which other sounds might not have. The point being that in such a space there's certain bands of frequencies enhanced and others are lowered over time. So if you do not hit this frequency band with your initial sound source, you might never get the same effect you see it got. Uh -huh. But with speech, you easily get it because, yeah, we have very high sounds like sibilance, we have low sounds, and so on. And you cover, you scan really the whole range. But it might well be. Was, was he using, like Schmitters, was he using using onomatopoeia or, or just. Uh, just in like ordinary speech. Actually, the text of I'm sitting in the room describes the process he's actually doing. So it's a self-preferential uh -huh. text. 
interesting. And I mean, I brought up the slide, this is the one I found. The slide actually refers to the first piece, Music for Solo Performer, which, believe it or not, uh, Graham, you were probably there, uh, and some of you, uh, uh, here at the uh, uh, Digital Resources Conference, a young uh, artist based in Germany, but from Colombia, Claudia Robles, she performed with um, the um, electromagnetic um, uh, cords to her brain. And while I think you see uh, sent the electricity to a percussion set, uh, Robles sent it to a video software. So what happened was she sat quietly for half an hour. It was very painful to watch because she, of course, was only thinking. <laughs> and her brain waves activated or sent electrical signals to the software, and that influenced what you will see on the, on the uh, visual side in the projection. <coughs> uh, so the, the second piece, uh, sitting in the room, that's the one that uh, you refer to. I bring you a couple of more slides in terms of sound installations. Ikeda, the Japanese sound artist, had this piece in, in Bristol not too long ago. Quite a frightening experience because I think it was a, a powerful uh, sound, high frequency, stressful perhaps, and perhaps certain frequencies again are uh, more disturbing to the brain or to your perceptive um, uh, organ. And also the, the fact that this was a narrow, a narrow corridor created a certain intensity switching from red to white light that I found uh, uh, quite um, uh, unsettling, but also exciting. And, and this summer, uh, I, I couldn't trust my eyes. I've never seen such an idea. You go to a museum and you see an exhibition, but it happens to be a sound artist. And people sit in these easy chairs and they watch videos. And then you realize after a while, Christian Markley is a uh, strange, uh, I guess, uh, in between person who I think is a sound person who now also uses video as a score for musicians. So every afternoon at five o'clock, the performers show up here, yeah, unpack their instruments, you yeah, you see a couple up there, and they look at the video and they use the video as a score. There was also a blackboard that uh, uh, Marty had put there. I think he called it the chalkboard score, and people could draw on it or write notes and so on. And the musicians would improvise freely from the score. And uh, the notion of using um, image as a score interests me also, and I uh, need to study this a bit further. Um, so these are just a couple of examples of recent work that I've come across. Uh, historically, uh, immersion and bringing the audience into a particular uh, arrangement. Yeah? This was a taking of of um, huge uh, um, inflated plastic. Uh, goes back to examples in 1966, John Cage was involved, um, uh, uh, and um, David Tudor involved in this uh, spectacular series of experiments over a series of nine evenings. This is Steve Paxton and Dick Wolf creating this sonic environment, where I think he explores tactility. Audience could touch the plastic, they were equipped with small radio transmitters. And both Paxton and Wolf, as well as Cage, I think, in this piece, try to use the, the ether, the, the atmosphere, yeah? the, the radio waves that were uh, reachable. And back 40 years ago, yeah. The electronic engineers were working on the diagrams for uh, these pieces. This is the one for Andonian. And here you see uh, uh, David Tudor somewhere mm -hmm. among the engineers. Lots of cables, yeah. And uh, this was still electroacoustic era, I think, moving towards um, controlling all the interfaces to the computer. I will just skip over this, but. Uh, the Brazilian artist Odisica for me was always important as an inspiration for three-dimensional space as he moved from uh, painting into sculpture into performance. 
for a performative environment because what I learned from him is an extraordinary sense of color, light, and then the, the, te the texture of color and light also outdoors, indoors, and how this can become part of the idea of wearing and performing color, so to speak. Uh, he built these parambolis uh, uh, costumes as wearables. And uh, I think primarily for him, uh, interest in color and motion, and in the three-dimensionality of the living uh, sensorial uh, experience. So art here becomes something that is uh, felt, experienced, uh, and enacted. And then the example that we often see for virtual reality art is a piece that probably we will not be able to reproduce anywhere uh, close to what she was able to do. She founded her own company in the 90s, a soft image, and she had a whole team of engineers and programmers. Yeah? So she refers to Osmos as an immersive virtual reality interactive environment installation. And the way this works, if you're not familiar, let's just practice it in our mind. Yeah? If we lower the light a bit. Because uh, you have to don equipment for this. So what she gives you is the um, head mounted display. So you're actually wearing a device in front of your eyes for the 3D images. And um, this is before we go to uh, the movie star and we get the smaller glasses, but uh, these are specially designed head mounted uh, devices. The second interface device is a sensor that's on the chest. And uh, she was trying to make the navigation of what the immersant sees and feels through two interface strategies. One was breathing and one was sense of balance. So depending on the, the sensors responded to your sense of balance and to the breathing. So your navigation of the world inside was through those two interfaces. Breathing and balance. Um, and this is navigation inside a virtual world. So what we're looking at now is the immersant uh, who stands there somewhere in a small space because basically the immersant is inside a, a virtual projected reality and uh, is sort of moving in. So we see this kind of strange shadow dance. Yeah? Uh, what the immersant sees are multiple layers and layers and layers of um, semi-translucent images, landscapes of nature. And I believe uh, the artist uh, came up with this idea of this form of becoming immersed through her um, experience of uh, deep sea diving. She said, I really wanted to create a sense of floating in, in space. And so you, you move up and down and sideways into this natural landscape. But it is not a natural landscape, it is a projected virtual world. Right? So what does it mean to be immersed in such a world? And um, in terms of my workshop experience last summer, I, I had a few other examples to give to my workshop participants. I said, well, uh, you can create a sensorial environment through light. Yeah? Uh, you can create it through perhaps a uh, strong sense of panoramic projection. <coughs> you can create it through sound, and then you can create it through perhaps objects and um, interfaces that involve the performer or the immersant through interaction. Yeah? So here are a few slides from uh, the work with the company here at the Dead Lab. Um, where somehow the gesture for me is the first interface with the world we're building. And this is what 40 years after Rob Schneider and the diagrams that they drew in 1966, what an Isadora environment looks like. I think in, in Sonic Art, uh, mostly I think uh, 
teaching is done through Max MSP and Jitter. But uh, um, in our department, we are using this um, uh, Isadora interface where what you're looking at is the programming. Yeah? And if it were alive, you would see numbers running yeah, everywhere because um, we are trying to bring data in that then transform what you see. The problem that I have is that um, the physical performance has a very hard time, I think, with the image performance. And uh, we can look at, at everything, at film, at video, at painting, uh, to, uh, to paint with images uh, and then, let's say, manipulate the image through a programming environment. Yeah? So here again is my environment. Uh, mm, I worked on a concert performance with a musician who had written this music and he said to me, Johannes, uh, the music is about bacon. Can you make some images? I said, no. <laughs> Possible, yeah. Uh, but we tried. And so what, what do I do? He had uh, written three uh, uh, parts for a singer, vocalist. So I asked the tenor, and the soprano, whether I could uh, shoot them. Yeah? And we try to then work also with this relationship of the vocalist to the microphone and to uh, the, the camera. And I was uh, working within that sort of tripticon arrangement that Bacon often uses, but it's very strange to try to approximate uh, what Bacon could do. And so, um, and yet, what I learned from it for our team here was the amazing gestural quality of the musicians. So while I'm trying to do my thing, which is the images, I'm actually looking at the percussionist, or I'm looking at uh, the violinist. And I, I noticed that the way he was performing gave me lots of ideas for um, uh, our new work. I need to uh, move forward. I wanted to let you hear a bit, but time is running. This concert is a mixture of electronic and acoustic performance with three image tracks. And um, again, the question that I would ask myself is, what happens when I just hear the music? And what happens if I see images to it? Can we turn the lights off? Eventually, you begin to see bodies. Then the voices come on, and uh, in a sense, body is then associated to the, the vocal music, but in, in a strange way because none of the images really uh, make necessarily sense in terms of what is being sung. Yeah? But uh, there are studies of the human body, obviously, uh, that uh, are done through the digital medium. And what we are now discovering, of course, is that. Digitally speaking, the digital medium allows the image to be compressed, filtered, and um, uh, distorted. So I think one project I want to do in the future is maybe a seminar just on filters. Yeah? So that we are looking at what happens if you have an image. Here it looks like a clean shot. Yeah? But uh, when the dancer begins to perform, she is um, using the uh, garment in a way uh, and the gesture to create a, a, a certain image, but also she's creating sound, and she has an interactive uh, um, interface with the image that appears on the screen. And um, what we're trying to learn right now is, in, in my work, we can't go into the image. 
Yeah? So this is a projection of one of our 3D worlds uh, on a 2D screen. It's a landscape. So uh, we don't have the virtual reality immersive apparatus. But um, how can you enter into the image or have a relationship uh, like an instrumentalist would with uh, uh, the outcome of the instrument? And so if the image was an instrument, how would you interfere inside yeah, the, the data dispositive? And what we are, we're at the beginning of this, what we're doing is we're trying to move the leaves in this uh, autumn landscape. No, you can, each time you check the pressure, Pressure changes dramatically. Mm -hmm. That is a change. So, so attached to the land, I really surrender all of our lives. The farmer has to study this like, like a new instrument, yeah. Pressure, pressure sensor, touch sensor. Change it into pressure. And um, the physical computing allows at the moment the leaf to fall and to rise, yeah. She now has to find the language to work with this and see whether this floating of leaves begins to become interesting as a, a, a relationship to the image. She can also uh, move the camera uh, left and right. Very primitive actually, but still for us a new, a new development. And the uh, research student who is working on the 3D is uh, interested in, in games. So he's using a game engine to control point of view. And again, here we are back to a visual language. Yeah? It's uh, ocular, point of view. And uh, Helena, the dancer, is looking at the image, while I think I'm imagining as a musical dance performance, she eventually no longer will look at this landscape, but will perform yeah, with the landscape. And um, I'm coming to the last five, six minutes. This performance with the landscape is what we are uh, trying to achieve as a, a subliminal interactive uh, kind of relationship where the audience is equally hopefully attracted to the gesture that creates acoustic sound to process sound and then to process image projections. So we have all these characters, uh, I'm now going to think of them as oral characters, characters that you can hear, yeah, and uh, characters that wear uh, speakers, characters that uh, have tiny emission sources. And here's actually where I might uh, wonder whether Frances Dyson is completely correct. She says, after all, if we're talking three-dimensional interactive and synesthetic installation environment perceived in the here and now, this immediately returns us to sound because sound always has these qualities uh, that the media mediates. The feeling that we're here now, we're experiencing ourselves as being engulfed, enveloped, absorbed in sound. But uh, when we're working with uh, this um, performance, we have surround sound, so we have quadrophonic sound, but we also have tiny, I don't know whether you could call them directional speakers, but the sound comes out like this. And if she goes with the speaker towards you, you will hear the sound coming towards you this way. And so it's not coming actually from behind, but it's coming from the front. So I think uh, certain smaller speakers perhaps have a more directional flow. And um, I'm wondering again how we can explore this in the concert and whether this makes an interesting difference for the audience. And obviously if a tiny sound comes from a, a sound source placed on the floor, it's a different effect from it uh, enveloping you. Yeah? So we created this character of the speaker woman and factory woman and, and so on. But um, before I come back to my own work, one example from this workshop. We had an artist from, um, mm, I think he's from University of Kent, who 
if you could lower the light, please. I'm going to bring up a very dark film. Was working on a beautiful installation that it took us some time to really grasp. He, he was able, because in the space we had the capacity to have a camera mounted up there that was capturing the space as a whole, and we also hung a projector up there. So we then rolled out the white dance floor, and uh, Jeff said, this will be a landscape. And um, I want to say that particular one is what score you would like to hear or have the process. So he doesn't have any music or sounds. He said, well, what do you think you will be hearing? OK, lights go out. And then he calls it lying bodies. And it becomes a meadow. Yeah? And on this meadow are these blotches. Mm. They're blotches, yeah? But these blotches slowly emerge to be persons. And then since it was an open installation for you, for us, uh, obviously you kind of you were sort of invited to walk on. So now what do you do? And then I realized, well maybe, or we realized, when you walk on, the camera will see you, and perhaps these lying bodies will begin to move. And the audience is, of course, learning now the rules of the game. Uh, we don't know yet what can happen, but we, we explore it. So as this uh, installation goes on, people slowly begin to go into the space. Yeah? And uh, this is what I wanted to <laughs> now, now, now the person on the grass just uh, rolled over a bit, yeah? or walk up. Now I wanted to, to raise this question of how do we critically or interpretively deal with this, what methodology could we use to talk about uh, our interactive relationship. And so I, I mentioned in my preparation for this talk, Irving Goffman in the 60s and 70s wrote a book called Interaction Ritual, where he became interested in, well, how do we behave towards one another uh, face to face? every day, in the train, in the workplace, yeah. at home, and uh, what kind of ritualistic uh, behaviors do we have? He also uh, speaks about saving face. How do we protect ourselves, or how, how are we outgoing, and how do we interact with others? And in this case, of course, it's a new media art installation, you're interacting with an image. This is very odd, isn't it? You, are, you, you have to come up with some form of enjoying this uh, uh, projected world by interacting with it. So the people who now are there are interacting, yeah? or they are wandering around, observing. And these kind of installations that were built during the workshop raised many, many questions about uh, interaction behavior, uh, dramaturgy, how do you design the space so that it's understood to uh, solicit certain kinds of behaviors. Yeah? Uh, can you interact with an image? What are the consequences? Yeah. Uh, does our action affect the image in a spontaneous way, or is the image almost pre-programmed and therefore has only a limited range of freedom? Yeah. So I, I come to my conclusion, uh, uh, not having had the time to really explore the vocabulary of now analyzing interaction behaviors that you could compose or plan and uh, uh, initiate, as well as the ones that you cannot perhaps plan and initiate and you invite. Um, we're still hearing the sound from the installation, let me just go out of that.
And I'll end with just a moment of uh, showing you uh, how now, in our case, the dancer will interact. And um, she is no longer looking at the virtual landscape, but she has become a leaf woman. She's wearing a leaf dress, and she, in a sense, uh, imagines being inside this landscape that she has to create. Now, how do I film this? It's very difficult. So you have the 3D landscape, and you have the dancer on stage, and how do I edit this together? I can't, yeah? So the, the dancer is somewhere underneath, and slowly you begin to see her again. But this I cannot do with the video, yeah? Or I would have to show the dancer here and the virtual landscape there. But to a certain extent, she is performing, sounding this landscape. And again, to, to work on performative techniques for this is, is very difficult because um, um, unlike certain dance forms or theatrical forms, uh, interactive half-immersive performance, uh, you have to, in a sense, develop your own techniques, how to do this. And perhaps it's an instrumental technique or it is a, a sensorial technique, uh, hopefully engaging the audience in this experience as an audience, and then if you make it available to the audience, uh, inviting the audience to be the interactor, then you have to, in a sense, provide the arrangement that allows them to experience this uh, sensorial, audiovisual um, event. So, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, and we open it for questions. And I, with your permission, will try to summarize or repeat your question for our online audience. Thank you. Um, are there any? I'll take. <laughs> Sorry. It's right. um, I just find it really fascinating, and I think it, 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 it's something that's really interesting. But I have absolutely no idea about how using what I've been shown today to explore in my own practice. If you were going to give somebody advice into stepping on from performing this live over into this immersive space, what would be your advice? Well, I think you saw a lot of my slides were actually of performance. And um, in terms of methodology, if we go back to our earlier meeting, um, uh, we mostly work from the physical to the digital. So we all start in the studio, and I think we have uh, a plan perhaps to explore, and we wanted to explore certain gestures, so we start with physical work. The rehearsals of the physical work are filmed. Uh, they are also collaboratively <coughs> done with musicians. We then uh, we, we gather material that is physical, as well as musical, as well as visual, in terms of our film. And then, as we continue to meet, uh, uh, a certain direction develops uh, what you want to explore. For example, do you want to combine a physical performance with um, a projection? Then you need to begin to bring the projection into the rehearsal space and work with it. Or, uh, you have a sound that you've created live, but uh, you now want to process it and, and change it then you need to, in a sense, work with some of the recording devices and then some of the software. So uh, the question of how there's a method, I think I would answer is depending on the process. I always work from the physical into the digital. Sometimes an image, yeah? If you think about uh, this one image that I very briefly showed you, for a split second. Um, uh, I found in a book on media archaeology, uh, and it intrigued me because 
Again, engineering is a uh, subject that I find fascinating. And this Russian engineer was doing a form of early motion capture. He was measuring the strike force of the woman with the, with the uh, prosthesis, and whether she could still use the hammer in the factory. And, uh, and I asked uh, some of our performers to work with uh, prosthetic hammer movement for a while. And uh, we also thought, OK, this is actually a percussive movement. Yeah? And let's see how we can uh, use it uh, acoustically. And so uh, you saw earlier we had uh, uh, the engineer with Clavis. Yeah? Uh, he, he's working with the, the two Clavis instruments. We then recorded the sound. We then digitally uh, distorted. And suddenly you have a five minute uh, sound performance. Mm -hmm. and, and then you build. Well, but mind you, uh, I hope this is not a worry that you have. What uh, our experience is, is of course that you cannot think these things so easily. You cannot imagine, okay, I'm going to use three projectors and um, the choreography would be. You have to actually go into the studio and work with the three projectors while you develop the choreography because uh, you cannot imagine how it will look. You have to work with it because uh, already the presence of the projector will change your choreography because when you just quickly set it up, it will be there, yeah, and then you're going to throw a shadow on the image. And that's not good. Then you have to hang it up, or you have to imagine, okay, don't want the image here. I want the image to, to rotate in the middle. Yeah? So then you have to build a device that rotates. Then you have to project from the side. Yeah? And um, in a sense, uh, create a sonography for your environment so that the physical performance and the image movement can come together. Sound. I think in our case the answer is simple. We are a team, yeah. 13, 14 people. Um, Helena dances. Uh, she took great interest, as did Anwar, in the um, costume that was created and practiced with the costume. We then have um, team members who uh, help with the sensors. Um, to, to apply it on the arm. We have a designer who builds it into the garment. And then we have uh, learned ourselves as a team to, to see what happens now. You have a data stream that comes in the sensor, and then you have the software, and then you have to see what you do. Okay? And often we use it either for sound or for video. And all of us more or less know how this works. Because it's not that difficult. You could probably build your own little setup. Yeah? If you get a, a sensor for you, and then you have Isadora, it's available. You can bring it into Isadora, and then you have your media files, and some sound, and some video. And once you connect them, you'll see that your data will affect the values in uh, your objects. So in Isadora, which of course is uh, known all over the world now because uh, Marco Video has taught it to everyone and it's uh, available to many people in the community. You can also download a free demo version. The uh, objects in this software are called actors. Mm -hmm. Actually a nice term, right? Mm -hmm. So you have, for example, the uh, projector actor and you have the movie actor and you have the media actor. So you get your media data from the arm, yeah? and then 
like what you're seeing here is she is controlling the faintly ghostly image of, of herself on, on the projection. And with the arm, yeah, she can uh, affect values of the video image. Speed, uh, brightness, resolution, uh, color, yeah. So you can put filters on it and uh, whatever you then do with the data can affect the image that we see. So in musical instrumental terms, that would mean that what she's doing here, um, and I, I'm not sure that the musical analogy is good, but she is uh, playing the uh, software like an instrument, so that the output, in this case video, is affected by the performance. And in the music technology world, this is called gesture controlled interface. Yes, gesture controlled interface. Yes. Um, I would like to do you have, like, when you start a project or your research, um, do you start from a craft principle, I mean, from the body, and you want to explore equilibrium, or you start from, I want to try this, uh, this new sound or uh, discovery I have from this performance I saw, I mean, what gets you into a project? It's from the body? from the media, or it's maybe I want to talk about uh, the environment, the leaves, I don't know, or the gestures. It's a combination of all these. I mean, we are actually, uh, uh, you know, while we were with our ensemble in Japan, we, we found we found these leaves, yeah? Uh, and we collected them, and then we created a, a studio rehearsal with leaves, and then uh, we, we built a, a sensor into the leaf so that uh, uh, Tatsura now is dancing with a leaf on her hand and a leaf dress. And um, so it's found objects, ideas, and also uh, from the physical and from an image of the physical we create new stories. You see the character up there? It's called Hammer Wound. So I had this idea that this is Helena actually becomes this uh, early 20th century Russian woman uh, who uh, goes back in the factory to work, yeah? And um, uh, she's a worker woman, yeah? And, and we were intrigued by the fact that on this historical photograph, this woman is not really wearing a worker outfit, but a, an elegant kind of dress. So we designed the dress for her. Um, and so uh, all of these issues come together, an idea for a story, design, and then the action. And, I mean, but personally, you as a director, you work with an ensemble as a director? We work collaboratively. Okay. Yeah. So we develop all of these things together, and um, I direct some of the process, but I think the performers are, of course, uh, highly self-motivated. And uh, so are our musician collaborators and designers. So uh, we, we complement one another. Can I just ask, in terms of the work itself, what are you trying to say as a director? Is it how far technology can be used? No, so you can say anything about technology. No, I want, right. I want to make a good piece. Yeah, so but a work that hopefully is sensually, poetically um, powerful to you. Okay, but is, is there a cultural or psychological or aesthetical sort of meaning behind that, or is it just there for... Well, you're, you're, asking, you're to... asking whether the artwork is an artwork that uh, can sort of convey some meaning. I hope that the content of our work is what you uh, gain from it emotionally and sensually. In other words, the piece lasts for about an hour, gives you many uh, evocations of sensual experience. Some of them quite beautiful, I think. Yeah. Some of them may be difficult to grasp mm -hmm. because it's mostly uh, mm, happening on a level of perhaps fiction and abstraction. That, however, you hear, you hear it and you see it, and you, in a sense, you make the story. Okay. We are telling a story, but uh, it's not uh, like a drama. Yeah. 
It's a, it's a poetic story about these characters. So hopefully the performance builds um, a poetic work. Um, but it, I mean, your question is actually good because sometimes when audiences hear that this is about the media or whatever, technological work, uh, they, they wonder whether we are worried about the technology. I'm not worried about it at all. You want to say with the audiences? No, with the work. But the work is good. Well, well, the the piece, the piece somehow comes together uh, to be something that I, I feel proud of, that it works as a, as a work of art. Yeah? Okay. We are using media and other techniques and crafts okay. to build it. The um, sensor technology or the interface technology is only a, a means to yeah, create, I think, your, um, your work. Well, in this sense, I mean, like, retrospectively in the work of the collective, um, could you say there's like a theme or a subject uh, that the, the, the works have in common? Or there's, I mean, that's what I was trying to, to ask before, like, the, what's the research? This, or is it, is it only the media or, I don't know, understanding what I'm saying. It's like, what's the um, subject? Is there a subject in common like gender or environment or uh, emotions or sensations in particular in the world? Yeah, I, I, I see your question. Um, uh, if the audience online did not hear the question, it's a question about the work and its, its uh, themes. Um, whether it is about the world or gender or emotion. Now these are of course very um, complicated terms that we're using. Um, uh, I think a number of my works deal with um, stories that we compose. And these stories are taken from the meters we have either in particular subject matter or coming from our lives. Yeah? So when I worked with the Paolo Chagas, uh, I became interested in my body, my point in my life and my age. I wanted to be one of those folks in Vegas. Yeah? And I also worked with two younger people uh, to see what in my relationship as a, an, an older man with two younger men yeah? and a younger woman. Yeah? So yes, you photograph the body with a particular interest in representing perhaps um, the kind of uh, um, dangerous melting, dissolving body that you see in bacon. So obviously I'm interested in bacon and my body. Huh? Then, in another work with the Japanese, we were interested in um, an old movie from the 60s called Woman in the Dunes. And we decided to make an adaptation from this old movie and to create a stage version that was interactive and digital. Uh, however, dealing with the woman as a central protagonist in this unstable world of sand. In this piece, uh, Okiyo deals with the ephemeral, with something that is transient, changing, um, like the seasons, and um, uh, also uh, instability of uh, something you hold on to. And instability then can refer to several things, the body, the sound, and the image also, uh, of a particular character. So um, Helena uh, creates a, a, a series of images that deal with our theme, and so do the other actors. And this builds, hopefully, a light motif for this whole piece. But, I mean, gender and emotion, that these are very vast concepts. Yeah? Um, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, Marianne. I think we need to talk something about the piece. Um, while she has all this again, that is related to the image, so she can move the image and she can interact. Is it a sound connected to it? Or the piece does it have any sound? A sound? Yeah. Um, and is that sound my, my question? First of all, just to understand if the piece has a sound. 
So is that sound connected with, for example, the fingers and each movement of the finger? Because I think I've seen works where they specifically point out parts of the body and, for example, in one arm, if you have a stretching or a flex or a rotational movement, each of that different movement has a sound related to that. And then connect that to an image and to a performance. But it might be interesting to see, but I don't know if it would happen there. Yeah. Um, yes, no, you're quite correct. Uh, that's a very good assumption. The question is about the gestural um, relationship to sound and whether each finger can perhaps control a particular sound. Uh, she has only one sensor here, so she can only control with her whole hand, even though she uses her fingers, uh, one particular sound and the image. Uh, if you want to control different sound parameters, you need to have more sensors. And then it becomes more complicated when you're sending multiple signals. But theoretically, you can do that, yeah. And some, some performers specialize, some musician performers specialize in this. But um, I will start with one, yeah? <laughs> uh, because um, uh, it's somewhat a bit tricky to have multiple uh, transmissions. And um, because well, the, computer, the computer can only receive so many data at the same time. And uh, if you separate the data streams, as well as assign different outputs to it, this is called mapping, yeah? it gets very complicated. Can she do it in different computers, for example? In different computers? And you mean if you have five computers there? For example. No, I mean it. She could, yeah. Uh, then you, can, you could even work with a specific, part, with a specified movement of each finger, and each computer could process it in a different way. Although I'm, 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 I should be careful what I say now, I believe uh, what you are now addressing is a technical parameter, dispositive. Yeah. The Bluetooth transmissions that we're using, or radio transmissions, they will probably be received by all five laptops. So if you have five computers and you have the software open in all, oh, they will all receive it, yeah? unless you, you find a way to block. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it gets uh, complicated, yeah. because you need to separate out, to separate out certain signals. Um, but this can be can be tested. But like with the wireless microphone, right now I'm on a certain radio frequency over there. Yeah? And once we have more wireless microphones in the room, we have to separate the frequencies. I'm just asking this because you you now related to the image, and I think that's very good. But if you think about all the sound that you the body of a performer. I don't know, I have this idea that if you could have a lot of sensors, each one transmitting a different sound with each movement, you could create an entire piece of music yeah. only with the body. And That's true. And the performer that is trained in it. And no, it's a wonderful idea. And uh, I don't think I have seen it, uh, maybe except with Lori Anderson. She comes out in, in her early days when she's wearing a white suit. Yeah. And I think these were contact mics. Uh, but she begins to use her body as a percussion instrument. Yeah? And, um, and then each trigger point on her body had a different uh, frequency. And so uh, she, she played herself as, a, as an instrument. I think I've seen before um, a musician or a technician, I'm not sure. Uh, that is watching the performer on stage, and every time the performer moves, he decides the sound, but it does not come from the performer. Mm -hmm. So it could be a really interesting happening. Yeah, and uh, obviously in interactive scenarios, uh, the, the effort was made to make the dancer or the performer also the controller of the sound, but some in other situations uh, there's a collaboration and the musicians are responding or are working with the performance in different ways. And um, the dancer is not necessarily always the best uh, musician yeah, to, to do the, the performance with, because this is very clunky in a way, because you are triggering sounds, Unless you're working with more sophisticated uh, data gloves and suits, you're perhaps 
certain kinds of you know, gestural control allow you to slide the sound or to, um, I don't know whether it's possible to um, uh, shape the sound through the gesture. Probably it is. It's very common when you try to. Okay. The problem being that you are doubling actually the gestures in sound. And so, where's the point? We all know the computer can do that. Yeah. So, it's a question of how you map the movements into yeah. sounds and vice yeah. versa. Yeah. So, because then otherwise you get the movement out of the yeah, yeah. Imagine yeah. after three seconds the audience has understood and so what? Yeah. yeah. And if you, like, if you do that with the entire body, I Translated one to one into sound. Yeah. So. Yeah. There has been quite a bit of work that's been done for that, um, also at in mm -hmm. France. And I think the question is just to build on what Johanna's um, people have been saying, it goes back to meaning. Like, all you do is that's it, we've got that present, that's the intent. And what happens, I think, what your question is, how do you, you have to manage a lot of data. Anything, we can capture anything in life that we want to. We can create sensors for anything we want to. That's not the problem. We're going to get a lot of data, and we have to filter that data. You were just talking earlier about how we work with image filters. We have to do the same thing with sound. Sometimes they just come prepackaged in your software, so you don't even know you're doing it. But somewhere, you know, there's this filtering process. There's choices that are being made and saying, I'm going to pay attention to this data and not that data. And then there's correspondence with the mapping. Choices that you're making are in a sense so essential to ask the question of can we, but why we? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what in song is always a very important factor is time. Mm -hmm. yeah. If the whole time passes for the audience, that's a central question actually in music and in any, any oral art form. So if the time passes one by one, uh, a couple of one by one, uh, to what is happening on the stage, that's just very difficult because you don't see the point actually. That this time has to be structured and to be composed actually, in a certain sense. And maybe even independently from what movements are, what the visual part is. And then both parts, the visual and the oral part, becomes even stronger because they are independent layers, even sometimes challenging each other, but that's much more interesting than uh, just the doubling each other. So that's actually what musicians always say because they feel a bit overwhelmed by the visual side. Human mm -hmm. beings, we are very much visual people anyway, also musicians are. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult not, yeah, it's difficult to enhance actually the, 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 the song. Sorry, I'm defending my, my science. Well. Uh, actually, yeah. it can enhance the visual side as well. Mm -hmm. I have a, um, perhaps a closing question because it's 5 30. You said, um, you noticed that you're interested in starting from the physical, going to the digital. Do you ever see yourself letting go of everything you've learned in, in the piece from the digital and see what the residue is left on the physical? Yeah. So to reverse it, so you yeah, take yeah. it, and then what's what because there's a, a shift in your whole practice, and then what is left if you were to have the The residue. I'm just thinking this residue. Uh, was this question understood? Uh, maybe I'll repeat it online. Gretchen Schiller, uh, thanks. How about how about for your commentary? Yeah. The other that was really this question of mapping you have to pursue. And then Richard asked me whether uh, there is a model which perhaps moving from the physical to the 
the pitch goal. What, what would happen if I move backwards? What is left? The residue of the physical. Unplug, yeah, unplug. Yes. I don't know, Gretchen. I think uh, sometimes I'm actually yearning for for the next work and not to have so much uh, laboratory and uh, interface design involved, but something maybe rather uh, simple like these summers in Germany in the coal mine are for me a retreat. Uh, every summer I spend two weeks in this abandoned coal mine and um, we tinker. But sometimes we do just very uh, simple uh, installations that are site specific and maybe we work with sound or one year we work uh, maybe just with movement in um, in an incline or declining space. Um, so I have a few photographs that I remember from the beginnings in the coal mine, uh, which were basically just movement in space. And I would still enjoy that very much. But uh, right now the pressure, of course, has increased with the lab. I feel I'm about 12 years behind in my development of the technology. So I'm actually still trying to catch up with understanding more about the intricacies of the software-hardware relationship and how I can make good performance uh, and you know, feel confident that the context that we're creating is working in favor of the performance. Because I obviously believe very strongly in performance and I come from the theater, but uh, in the lab, it's very much now design and software technology that's taking up a lot of space. The residue is my body. It's becoming more frail. <laughs> it's actually becoming more frail, and so I think um, I'll have to be careful. So we all have to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> with all this residue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And so next week, um, uh, I won't be able to be here next Wednesday to host the session. Johannes is going to be hosting the session with Misha Myers next week. And I'll just read, can I read you two things? It's called, are you ready for this? Is that a pistol in your pocket? Coral consciousness and the performance of enclosure and concealment. She does a lot of work with voice and performance, and so she'll be in here next week. It's a great pair of patterns because it's usually every other week. She's in here next week at four. Yeah. Can I uh, also make an announcement if that's okay? Yeah, yeah. Because we, we just, we just learned, and I'm, I'm proud, especially for, for my team, we just learned that we. We are going to be able to show to show Kiyo, um, at the Lillian Bailey Studio at Center Square in late November on a Friday night, and I I have the invitation, so we can pass those out, and uh, maybe if you have time, what's the date? Come out. It's Friday, the 26th of November. That will be our London premiere. So, and I think we have a little bit of a social uh, gathering with the rest of the coffee, so some of you, if you want to yeah. stay, uh, I'll be happy to talk to you. Yeah. And we thank our online audience for, for staying with us. Thank you. There's two more left. Go for it. Thank you. Thank you. One more left. Oh, there's Yes. 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 One second, yeah.